The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Warhol and Basquiat on the stage in London, Faith Ringgold at the New Museum in New York, and Betty Saar recreates a mural in Los Angeles. The collaboration, a new play dramatising the relationship between Andy Warhol and Jean-Michel Basquiat and the period in which they worked together on a group of paintings, has opened at the Young Vic Theatre in London. I talked to the playwright Anthony McCartan and the director Kwame Kwe Amar. As a Faith Ringgold retrospective opens at the New Museum in New York, I talked to Massimiliano Gioni, the exhibition's curator. And at the Freeze Art Fair in Los Angeles, Helen Stoilus talks to Julie Roberts, the co-founder of LA Gallery Roberts Projects, about a mural by Betty Saar, created and quickly destroyed in 1983 and being repainted for the fair. Before all that, the new series of our sister podcast, A Brush With, continues. On the podcast, I talk to leading artists in depth about the influences and cultural experiences that shape their life and work. The latest episode is A Brush With, Alison Katz, the Canadian painter. Do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear that and to explore the catalogue of more than 30 conversations. And do also subscribe to The Week in Art and give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. It helps others to find us. Now, a new play about Andy Warhol and Jean-Michel Basquiat opened this week at the Young Vic Theatre in London. Starring Paul Bettany as Warhol and Jeremy Pope as Basquiat, the collaboration was written by Anthony McCartan, the man behind the biographical films The Theory of Everything, about the theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking, and The Two Popes, about Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis. And it's directed by the Young Vic's artistic director, Kwame Kweama. It focuses on the period between 1983 and 1985 when Warhol and Basquiat worked together on a series of paintings eventually numbering 150, some of which were shown to critical derision and commercial failure at the Tony Schifrazi Gallery in New York. McCartan's adapted the play into a film which goes into production later this year. I spoke to McCartan and Quay Amar just before the curtain went up on the play's opening night. Anthony, I wanted to begin with you. Is it right that you saw shows by both Basquiat and Warhol in New York at the same time and that was kind of what prompted you to think about this dialogue? Indeed, March 27th, I think, 2019, I was invited by a friend to New York and I saw a a triumphant uh, uh, retrospective of both artists on the same day and walked between the two galleries across Lower East Side Manhattan which was the stomping ground of both Andy and Jean-Michel in their heyday. So th- this was the sort of the, the catalytic moment for the, for the idea. And did you see these dual paintings at that time? No, I didn't. No, they were separate exhibitions. And what was clear and what sort of got my mind, imagination functioning, was the sheer difference of their artistic approaches. And then the knowledge that I acquired and uh, through conversations with people that they had worked together begged the question, well, how did that work? You know, what went on in that room? What what must their, their discussions about, you know, art theory and what art is meant to do? Why do we have it? And in, it, in the idea of this dialogue between these two very different artists, the, the play was born. Um, one of the things about them is that if you watch films of either of them, mm. they're not very forthcoming. No, so we, we have very little idea of what they sounded like, really, when they were actually themselves. Mm. So, so was it difficult to give them voices? Yeah, very much so. Um, but it's kind of what we have to do is get under the, the hood of these characters. And in the case of Andy, his greatest creation almost is himself. He was almost all persona. And yet... His diaries reveal a different character from the one that you see on screen or in interviews and so forth, where he's pretty much monosyllabic. He doesn't want to give anything away. But the diaries belie a different character. He was torrentially gossipy, loved puncturing people's sort of balloons, and um, and he was insightful. 
uh, about art, and he was full of, of sort of submerged energies and passions, which had never really been um, dramatized. So there was a great opportunity there with him. And with Jean-Michel, uh, also barely said boo in any interview that I ever saw with him. And so I had to resort to the works themselves, which, which when you study them, he is a great student of art and, and what art has always done, you know, from... He studied the classics, Da Vinci, you know, Rembrandt. He knew Western art deeply. But there was a big gaping absence in Western art that he was able to fill, which was blackness in art. And there had never been anyone who had really tried to put blackness at the center of Western art. And so when he appeared on the scene, he carried the freight of all that expectation and the cultural pressure of being the first. Um, Kwame, when you come to stage this play to what extent can you reflect the kind of visual dynamics that Anthony's just described that that you know to what extent was there an attempt to do that or do you have to kind of work around it because obviously you're, you're dealing with live actors you don't want to just fill the stage with paintings tell us about the visual appeal of the show the aesthetic of the show is born out of the characters and is born out of the actors who are performing those characters. So for instance, our rather wonderful Basquiat, played by Jeremy Pope. There is no way when we were looking for actors that we would know that they could actually paint. Whereas Jeremy can paint. You know, we kind of got people in and when we, we, we did our first couple of weeks of rehearsals in New York and we got an artist in to kind of just help them. I thought just kind of get techniques. And then <laughs> Jeremy started doing these faux Basquiat's and we we're like oh my god let's go and flog them on down the street like <laughs> you know someone might give us a couple of hundred million who knows um, and so actually once that began um, one could see that then one could think that the art we have to do this play without the art it has to exist without the aesthetic of Basquiat's work or Andy's work and it wasn't really until uh, you know a week before opening that we began to see the the art or the aesthetic, and yet the play, so beautifully written by Anthony, worked. And that's really when you know it's about like doing a play about music, and you know you go, oh no, God, we have to wait on the music. If you have to wait on the music, then you haven't got the play. So in a kind of way, that's a rather long way round of saying that the aesthetic was born of the actors that we have playing the characters that we have, and then for moments. The art, we breathe in the aesthetic, but it's secondary to the characters. Did you have to, in a way, work back from the art in terms of characterising them in the, as these very distinctive characters? So you, you have that art that you saw in New York, moved by in New York, and you think, OK, so I'm going to work back from here and find out what compelled them to, to make this kind of work. Yeah, the, the research really began then. And, uh, you know, in both cases, you want to find out about the biography and, and the first order of business is to do your research. But we can't be strictly just bound by biography or we're just reproducing biography and we're trying in our own way to create art ourselves and art is in its essence interpretive and so I was trying to find something that they would not even perhaps own up to or want publicly to own up to which was a kind of deeper truth and and it's reading sometimes between the lines it's it's studying a painting and saying look there's there's the themes and issues that Basquiat keeps returning to why is that you know and and then you go okay this is the seed of drama yeah if we can bring this this sort of almost like a large hadron collider effect of two particles colliding and then there's a sort of boom there's this effect you know there's a wonderful quote that i read i think only a little before i received this this play and I'll misquote it, but it says something like, faith calls it spirits. Scientists calls it energy. We call it vibes. And I was really interested in that because that is quintessentially what's happening in this play. Is that Jean has said, I understand Western art. Now, where's the soul? Now, I might argue, I look at a Rothko and I see soul. But he's saying, where's the soul? from a black lens and I don't need Picasso to tell me I don't need Picasso to assimilate my stuff and send it back to me where's mine we have artists like Romare Bearden of course who very clearly set an Afrocentric core on top of a European discipline of collage 
and put the story. So we know that Basquiat wasn't the first, but he was so bold in his assertion of a dramaturgical approach that was different to the Western canon. And that's what's deep in this. Exactly. And of course, when one looks at the optics, let's call them, of the Warhol-Basquiat relationship, it could immediately suggest exploitation, right? And to, to what extent did you want to have that kind of tension there in the play? As you know, because, because a lot of people, I think, will come to it perhaps with that preconception. I think one of the wonderful things that Anthony did was actually to, to not endow that on the topsoil, but to know that we'll be walking in thinking that. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, but he subverts that in the text really quite quickly, that this is a battle of equals. This is a battle, and, and John even says it, look, yo, don't ever look down on me. I paraphrase your words badly. But <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, don't look, we are equals, and if we're not equals, I'm going home. And so actually, I think that's a prejudice that people walk in with and a viewpoint that people walk in with. And, and hopefully what we've done in realizing Anthony's wonderful thinking around this is slightly challenge it. Is slightly say, of course, exploitation sits at the bottom of any relationship. But that wasn't the core of Basquiat and Warhol's relationship. And Anthony, of course, one of the things about this moment is, of course, now they're both icons of contemporary art, icons of the, the last 50 years of art. But at that time, Warhol was sort of almost a maverick character. He, he wasn't being taken terribly seriously. Basquiat was on the up. You know, he was fated. He was in celebrated group shows. He may not have had a massive museum presence, but he was certainly the artist who was perceived as having the edge of the two. So there's a, there's a curious dynamic in that too, isn't there? Yeah, it's one of the central questions of the play is why are you doing this? And they ask it of each other. And they both have different motives at the beginning. In, in the case of uh, Warhol, yeah, museums were no longer buying his work. His prices were in decline, which is pretty amazing to think now that there was a period where his reputation was going down, but, but that, that was the case. And Basquiat was this hot new thing, and he was on the cover of the New York Times magazine, and everybody wanted a piece of him because he was the new hot thing. And, um, and, and yet he was almost, almost in danger of being taken like a fad, and it might just, like a soap bubble, disappear. So there was an, uh, they, they shared a, an agent, uh, uh, and his name was Bruno Bishopberger, and he saw a, an opportunity for both of them, that Basquiat could align his name with the most famous artist in the world. That would be good for him and probably give him longevity as an artist. And Andy could tap into youth energy and be hip again. And so they both had initial kind of, prurient motives perhaps to get to to embark on this collaboration but what history tells us and what i've tried to do in the play is show that a deep love formed between these two very different people kwame can you tell us something about how you work with the actors who are working with people who once existed you've done it before with one night in miami obviously the temptation for those actors would be always to, to look at everything they can possibly find to what extent do you encourage that to what extent do you leave them to their own devices uh, a combination of both. I would say that Paul Bettany, who, who plays Andy, uh, is magnificent, and Jeremy is magnificent in my humble opinion, because they do two things that I think are very important. They open with the character as we think we know them. They lead us into the door of our world. Then they become this mythical thing, this thing that is ours, that is Anthony's. And then they close the shop, and come out through the door back with what might be perceived as a key characteristic. So I think for me, often it is, whenever I do, you know, people who, who have lived before, it is, do not do an impression. Give me a hint of the thing that we know, and then go in. Because no one is the same, are they, as their personality that they put out. All of us have our interior and who we are at home. And we know this because invariably the partners and the children of all these greats tell us a completely different story than the personality that we've, we've been used to. And also I think I tend to want to cast really intelligent actors that I know would have done their research so that when we hit the ground, actually my job is to say, I can see your research. 
Let's take that away. I can see your research. Take that away. Let's go to the human. That's really fascinating. One of the key, you've already referred to it, the key dynamics in this relationship is, is race. And there's a seminal moment which happens in New York during this, the time of this relationship, which is the death of Michael Stewart. And this is relatively underreported in Britain, I would say. But he's a graffiti artist who was, who's brutally murdered by the police, effectively. And he was a close friend of uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat. And you've brought that into the heart of the play, haven't you, Anthony? Tell us about that. Yeah, it seemed that there was the ultimate expression of Jean's art and his technique and his ambitions were in a single painting for me called Defacement, which is his attempt to address the Michael Stewart murder by New York City police officers. And in that work, I, I saw that there was the, a, an opportunity for a, a spiritual discussion about what art is and what it's meant to do. I did... I. I decided to import that and deal with that in the play well before George Floyd. So it was not an, a sense that I'd seen the George Floyd thing, and I thought, let's let's use that to any extent. But it does have an, an enormous contemporary resonance. think they call that zeitgeist? Yeah. I mean, I might be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but if they restrained him. They, they, they put handcuffed him behind his back, and they knelt on his neck. I mean, the, the parallels are, are spooky completely spooky and so that um, Jean had to deal with this and how do I deal with it I deal with it through my art and this is the opposite of what Andy did he tried to use art to push emotion away that's why it was all pretty and exterior and superficial and surfaces beautiful but inert you know and intentionally inert so that emotion non-emotion pushing it away you can't push it away any longer the explosion when you can't any longer keep it at bay and one of the key things that I think Keith Herring said about that incident was that, that Jean's reaction was, it could have been me. And I think that's the sort of crucial thing about his identity and his, his position in New York at that time. As you say, this, this trailblazing figure within the New York art world at that time, but he was extremely vulnerable. And I, it seems to me, and it's certainly true in the, in the script, that he was very alone. And you have to bring that out, right, Kwame, that sense of he's part of a massive scene and yet he's, he's very alone in certain ways. There is a bandwidth tax around black excellence and black leadership. There is a loneliness that is deeply imbued into the DNA of being in white spaces when you are non-Caucasian. I, I could see that in John like really quickly. And if you look at any of the films about John outside of Michael and Freddie, you, he's like nearly always the only black person in his environment. And so actually, I remember many years ago that, you know, I, you know, Denzel Washington is one of my favorite actors. And I remember Denzel speaking once and he said, you know, yeah, 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 I'm doing well and everything's great, but I still can't get a taxi in New York. And that kind of never leaves you. And John was young. And we can see that he was dysfunctioning because he didn't know what to do with his money. He had a critique of capitalism that was just like, I'm going to take the money, but I'm going to then throw it somewhere in, in corners. That was how he dealt with how do I move from being middle class to then almost sleeping on the street for my art and, and my identity to now being celebrated as the only one. And so I, I, I was really interested in your question about race, because race is, of course, in particularly in America, but in this country, race is, is deeply interconnected with anything. But I find class actually, to be a really fascinating facet of this play. Mm. Andy often makes comments that, you know, you really need to be more civilized. Of course, that's race and class. You've got such bad manners, race and class. You know, so for Jean, I think class and race, it, it must have made him so lonely yeah. that no wonder he ran and hid in many excesses that, that many artists hide in. And of course, that's one of the complicated things that you get across, isn't it? Because Jean-Michel actually grew up in a brownstone and, and Andy's from, you know, a working class Catholic Pittsburgh family. And, but what I'm interested in is to what extent does the play resolve that whatever it was that drove Jean-Michel to addiction, for instance, and drove some of Andy's neuroses? And to what extent do you resolve those or do you ask questions of them? Well, I hope we do. I hope we do. I think that that's the core of it in the end is when you when you abandon the persona and the defensive mechanisms, what's left. And we really strip these two people bare in many ways, quite literally at some point. They both take their shirts off and it's it's not gratuitous. It, it's on the edge of, 
of it's perhaps, on the line <laughs> <laughs> seeming <laughs> like um, um, homoerotic it, images it kind of sits right at there but they're top. filming each other and they're making a film and we're still within the context that we're andy's filming him and asked jean to take his shirt off and it's a highly charged moment and it speaks to a lot of tropes and stuff like that but it is analogous to what the play is doing we are removing layers that have been carefully prepared and built up over years and it speaks to all of us this is what we are what is a personality if not just a successful performance that we've developed over our lifetime you know what do we conclude about the artworks that emerge from this extraordinary moment what's your assessment of them after all this baggage that you're dealing with yeah, I mean, aesthetically, they're challenging. The two styles don't naturally mesh. But as a record of two icons, um, it's without precedent. For me, when I look at them, I'm left with that lark in line, what remains of us is love. Kwame? I, I think there's something beautiful about them. There's something beautiful about the clashes of Western and, and African philosophy. It, for me, feels really genre. Part of the reason I wanted to do this, as soon as I read it, I was just like, yes, please, please, yes, was because I, I think, and, and one has to come to one's art through our own personality construction. And I think the battle of trying to find African aesthetics in a Western world, or as Harry Belafonte once said, one of the problems that we have as black dramatists or black artists is that we are creating Afrocentric work and trying to put it in a Eurocentric stage. And I think that's what the two pieces of work that do for me. It is Europe and Africa trying to find its way. Kwame and Anthony, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. The collaboration is at the Young Vic in London until the 2nd of April. Coming up, we hear about the Faith Ringgold retrospective at the New Museum in New York and a mural recreated by Betty Saar in Los Angeles. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. Tate is to commission a contemporary artist to create a site-specific installation in what was until recently the restaurant at Tate Britain in London, which contains a mural by Rex Whistler, painted in 1927, with vignettes that the Tate now categorises as derogatory and distressing imagery of a black child being kidnapped from his mother and enslaved, and caricatures of Chinese figures. As Martin Bailey reports, Tate closed the restaurant in 2020 and then set up a group to oversee what became known as the Rex Whistler mural discussions, involving consultations with outside artists, art historians, cultural advisors, civic representatives and young creative practitioners. The group has recommended that a contemporary artist should be invited to create a new installation in the room which will then be open to visitors as a display space. Also in London, the Courtauld Gallery has removed two items from its gift shop and online retail platform relating to the artist Vincent van Gogh after complaints that the products belittled mental health issues. As Gareth Harris writes, the items, an eraser in the shape of an ear costing £6 and a £5 bar of soap, described as ideal for the tortured artist who enjoys fluffy bubbles, first went on sale on the 3rd of February but have now been withdrawn. The products had accompanied the current exhibition Van Gogh Self-Portraits, which was discussed on this podcast in the 4th of February episode. And finally, the Cuban-born artist Carmen Herrera has died, age 106. Herrera was known for her precise, radiant geometric work centred on crisp lines and contrasting chromatic planes, says the Listen Gallery, which has represented the artist since 2010. The gallery said that she died peacefully in her sleep at her apartment and studio in New York, where she'd lived and worked since 1967. As Gareth Harris reports, in the past three decades, Herrera received long overdue recognition, first with a survey at the Museo del Barrio in New York in 19. 19- and later at the Icon Gallery in Birmingham, UK in 2009, the Whitney Museum of American Art in 2016 and the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston in 2020. You can read all these stories and much more at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android, which you can download from the App Store or Google Play. We'll be back after this. 
The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. As the 20th, 21st century art season returns to Christie's, first open post-war and contemporary art online brings you an exciting selection of international post-war and contemporary art and photography at accessible price points. Among other gems within the sale, the collection of Ellen and Dan Shapiro offers 44 photographs from the couple who were early champions of the medium and began collecting in the 1980s. Their collection includes works by Andreas Gursky, Irving Penn, William Eggleston, Annie Leibovitz, Cindy Sherman, Diane Arbus and Zanelli Maholi, among many others. First Open will also present six paintings by the renowned British architect and Royal Academician Will Alsop, sold to benefit the Stephen Lawrence Architecture Prize. The First Open auction is open for bidding from the 23rd of February to the 9th of March. Find out more on Christie's.com. Welcome back. Now, this week, the new museum in New York opened Faith Ringgold, American People, which it's billed as the first full retrospective in New York of the now 91-year-old Harlem-born artist. It takes us through the astonishing breadth of Ringgold's career, from the early portraits in the American People series that culminates in the three murals she made in 1967 at the height of the civil rights struggle, through her political activist works of the late 1960s and 1970s, her tankers and quilts made from the 70s through to today, and her children's books that have led to a claim far beyond the art world. I spoke to the exhibition's curator, Massimiliano Gioni. Massimiliano, I, I was amazed to see that this is actually the first retrospective of Faith's work in New York. That seems an unfathomably long time to wait for this. Tell me about that. Well, to be precise, actually, her last retrospective in New York was at the old New Museum on Broadway in 1998. That show was actually the occasion in which Faith Ringel premiered her French collection, which plays a very important role in our exhibition, too. Uh, but still, now that's um, 30 years ago, and quite significantly, the previous survey was in 1984 at the Studio Museum. So... You know, they were um, 14 years in between. And at the same time, Faith, you know, was able, mainly through her books and also her very, very intense uh, traveling shows that she often organized herself, uh, was able to create a kind of personal distribution system for her art that bypassed uh, these interests from institutions in New York City. Tell me about how you've grappled with the sort of very early years of Faith's life, because, of course, she grew up in this extraordinary moment of the Harlem Renaissance. How much context do you give for the early years before she became a mature artist, as it were? I think, you know, that those biographical elements are present in the exhibition. It's quite interesting. You know, she was born in 1930, so that was the kind of tail end of the Harlem Renaissance, but the Harlem Renaissance plays a, a crucial role in what is a sort of personal mythology that she has created with her own story quilts and with her own novels. So um, it's not reconstructed in the show per se, but it's um, constantly woven into the, the fabric of the quilts in the fabric of her own work. The show starts with her paintings from the 1960s, uh, which I think are going to be quite a revelation because they haven't seen in such numbers uh, um, in New York City in, in decades. We are very lucky to have also the three murals from 1967, The Flag is Bleeding, Die, and USA uh, Postage Stamp, which we believe are brought together for the first time in a museum show in New York since 1984. So uh, the, the first rooms with American People series and Black Light series are really quite stunning. She had a remarkable style really early on, didn't she? In that American People series, that graphic style that she developed. It's, it's a really interesting moment to develop a figurative style that was so individual, isn't it? Because, of course, that was amid the climate of minimalism and conceptualism and so much other sort of process art, all that kind of stuff. And here's this extremely well-developed, it seems to me, figurative style. Yeah, she called this super realism. That is also quite interesting because of the connection, obviously, to surrealism and to hyperrealism. It was a very graphic style, you know, extremely contrasted, very, um, let's say, efficient in a sense. And, and that, I think, is also the key to, to works like the three murals, which are almost declamatory you know, and, and so powerful. And the fact that she calls them murals, even though they're on canvas, uh, also express her desire, I think, to reconnect to a history of muralism that, you know, goes back probably even to the Mexican muralism or to, to Picasso Guernica, which was her inspiration for 
uh, for Dai. You know, actually seeing all the works in the first gallery together, the first gallery focuses on American people and early works. The second gallery has the three murals and, and black light. So seeing the, the first uh, uh, gallery is quite interesting also in the context of 1930s American realism. You know, it's interesting to see that she's clearly thinking of that work. You see or I see also an interest or a dialogue with Jacob Lawrence's work, but less uh, geometrical and, and in a sense, both more surreal, but also, you know, she was looking, as she says, at everything that was happening in America. And so the first room is also very much about refusal. There are these kind of walls of opposition with, you know, white men in ties and uh, staring at you or the neighbors is another painting where you have all these people staring at you. Uh, so there is a sense of uh, of refusal and opposition that is very strong in those works, which obviously uh, were born in the context of the civil rights movement. And that also told a story that was her first experience of refusal. You know, famously around that time, she tried to become a part of Spiral, the collective that, that Norman Lewis was a part of, that Bearden was a part of, and she was treated somewhat condescendingly uh, by this all-male group. And, and so her experience of refusal also had a lot to do with being a woman, and that clearly marked her politics and her work from that moment on. There's a really interesting point in the catalogue where Mark Godfrey talks about that moment where Bearden writes to her and effectively tells her that she needs to, you know, develop a kind of style where you, the eye follows through the composition, etc. And Mark argues that even though she was crushed, as he put it, that in some ways it inspired her to sort of, in a way, respond to Bearden by developing her work in spite of the criticism rather than sort of taking it too much to heart. Yeah, I mean, it's one could probably write a history of contemporary art from the lessons learned by refusal. Now, if you think Duchamp builds, <laughs> builds the history of 20th century art because he's asked to remove a painting. So uh, I'm sure that, that, you know, that lesson was uh, tough and uh, at the same time had a tremendous impact on, on Faith's work. But, you know, the great news, which I think actually informs her career, and she says this much also in, in the interview in the catalog, she says that much in, in her biography, Every time somebody told her that she couldn't do it or she was not able to do it, that was actually a reason for her to go out and do it. So I'm sure that refusal, you know, pushes her uh, to to join Spectrum, which is another collective gallery, not a whole black collective gallery like uh, Spiral. And that's where she makes the murals. Their refusal informs uh, her position as a feminist. You know, she says also as explicitly at the end of the 60s when she started demonstrating at museums. And we have a wonderful gallery with amazing vitrines of documents that my colleague Madeleine Weisberg put together, which uh, collects, you know, press releases, flyers, uh, speeches. And, uh, you know, she was literally counting how many black artists or how many women artists were in the shows. There are photos of her demonstrating. So she says, you know, she was doing all that work and then the doors open a little and guess what? Only the black male artists were allowed into the museum. And she said, you know, something is not working at this point. And she says, you know, I had to become a feminist. All this to say that every time somebody said no, she was empowered to, to continue and to create, create new conditions for the existence of her work and new conditions for existence of herself. You know, the, in the 70s, she abandons oil painting and canvas and starts working on fabric. And she says with, you know, a, a, an amazing, almost confessional tone, she says, I was tired to wait for my husband to come home from work and help me move the canvases. And, you know, it's beautifully personal, it's candid, but it's obviously an incredible political statement that she said, you know, I'm not going to wait for a guy to help me and I'm going to make this uh, work on fabric. And because of making the work on fabric, she can also roll it and ship it much more easily. And that uh, starts um, the success of Faith Ringle work in America beyond uh, New York. So this ability of making a virtue out of necessity and combining what maybe was a refusal and a failure and make it into a strength and combining the personal and the political, like they said in the 70s, is very much central in her uh, career, I think. 
um, talking about the personal and political, and we'll come back to the fabric works in a minute. I, there's that striking work of course, you've mentioned, Die, which is an extraordinary work, and, and and in a way might be the work that she's most known for now, particularly because of the prominence that MoMA gave it in the rehang in 2019, among other things. But there's the work that she made, one another of the murals, which it seems to me is again incredibly prescient and unfortunately incredibly powerful today and incredibly relevant today, which is the work, which is the stamp for the advent of black power. And one of the things that, that's really striking about that work is you can, most people can see the black power that runs diagonal across that work. But one thing that people often don't see is that actually there's white power written across the composition. It seems to me that that's a really sort of dramatic way of presenting, obviously, this idea of white supremacism that yeah. was very prevalent in her mind at that time. Yeah, and, uh, you know, there is also the fact that is some sort of uh, speculative... Um, fictional fabulation, the idea to imagine that in 1967 that the post system would issue a stamp uh, commemorating black power. You know, she's it's on the realm of science fiction and, and she does it both with a, a kind of matter of fact concreteness but at the same time she, she's obviously fully aware that that's not going to happen and uh, I still don't even know if he has happened to this point and <laughs> to this, uh, this date. So um, and, and just a, a in a matter of few years later, um, she begins the Black Light series, which is this amazing series in which she does not use white. So in a complete reversal of the, the kind of omnipresent of white power within the texture of the stamp painting, you know, a couple of years later, or actually one year later, she begins this series uh, in which she uses no white color. And so she makes this amazing rapport studies of blue and black and, uh, and these paintings that don't include any white. So tell me about the fabric works then, because one of the things that's striking about her use of fabric is that like, it obviously directly connects to, of course, to um, African-American quilt, that, that tradition, but directly to her mother too. And she, her mother was actually even directly involved, right? Yes, well, um, it depends what you define fabric works. You know, the, in a sense, it's uh, better to step back. You know, the last... Uh, Paintings on canvas actually are um, the the incredible painting she makes for the women's house, which is uh, uh, the the painting in Rikers Island, which we literally received yesterday, and that took a lot of diplomacy and the involvement of uh, you know the Brooklyn Museum, the Department of Corrections, the Design Commission, and so on. They all came together to to allow this painting to join the retrospective, and there was. A, a public commission that she makes for the prison, and that's still an oil on canvas, stretch on wood, very large. Um, and that's uh, probably the last painting on uh, oil paint that she makes. Uh, actually, the fabric works, she begins them in 1971, and they're still oil, but they're on unstretched canvases. Um, those works, and that's also something we stress in the exhibition, are inspired by uh, Tanka paintings, by Tibetan votive paintings, which she sees at the Ruby Museum in New York and the Rijks Museum in, uh, uh, in Amsterdam. And, you know, I emphasize this because an amazing thing that, that is apparent in the exhibition is also how faith rewrites the history of art by looking beyond canonical works of uh, high art as it's described by a very Western American and white canon, you know, in which she was growing up. And so she really starts uh, looking at non-Western art, at global art, at Tibetan art or African art, and, and really weaves it into the work. So the early works in fabric are not quilts. She's using fabric and in the 70s, she's painting on them and they're more inspired by uh, non-Western art, uh, particularly African art and, and Asian art. And then um, in the early 80s, uh, she starts making the quilts. The first one is actually made with her mother, Willie Posey, uh, who was a seamstress and a fashion designer. Uh, and together they work on this quilt that it's called uh, Echoes of Harlem. And, uh, you know, technically that is not a story quilt. It means it's a quilt painted, but without text on it. And then a few years later, she starts making the, the story quilts. You know, with quilting, uh, obviously she's reconnected 
to a history of, let's say, vernacular art or a history of women's work, which are typically not, and particularly back then, not recognized as high art or as part of the canon. And there she does the same that she does with Asian art and African art. You know, she incorporates art forms that are not deemed reputable enough to, to be part of the canon, uh, but she completely reconfigures hierarchies of taste and, uh, and art history. And more specifically, she's looking at women's labor. And, and so in that, uh, there is also a very polemical choice. Um, it's a kind of soft polemical position because she's using soft materials, but she's immediately latching on to a, a whole legacy of women's work and also gender and, and racially specific work in the case of the quilts, because she's connecting to the tradition of quilting in um, the south of the United States. And of course, she embarks on these great series. You've already mentioned the French collection there and the American collection followed. So tell us about those collections, because they are sort of multi-part works which come together and, and they are deeply reflected reflective about the history of art, for instance, as well as all sorts of cultural issues. Yeah. So she starts working in series and cycles uh, in the 80s, but the most prominent ones are the, the, the French collection and the American collection, or, or at least two of my favorite are, uh, which date from the 90s. You know, in the exhibition, we wanted to to make a couple of points uh, um, or a, a sort of gentle polemical points. Uh, one was to, to stress and emphasize also Faith Ringel as a maker of sculptures. Uh, you know, those are very seldomly seen and she calls them soft sculptures, which if you think also, you know, she makes them in the 70s. So after minimalism, after process art, but they, they are, if you think uh, of all the guys working, you know, with their lead and wood and so on, and she's making soft sculptures. And again, it's an amazing combination of the personal and the political because by making soft sculptures, she can ship them around university museums and uh, other uh, institutions where she goes and, and, and the sculptures are also used as props and they become tools for performances. So we wanted to emphasize uh, face work as a sculptress, but we also make a point of presenting Faith Ringel as a writer. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, nowadays we, we hear a lot about autofiction, the mixture of autobiography and fiction. We hear a lot in the field of academia and particularly in America about critical fabulations, which is how Sadia Hartman describes her mixture of, uh, you know, fiction and historical research. And I think many of these uh, were uh, um, approaches that, that Faith starts working with when she makes the, the story quilts. Uh, the story quilts also end up in her children books, which are responsible for the fame and recognition well beyond the art world. Tony Morrison speaks about rememories. This idea, not so different from from what Sadia Hartman does, of you know, an erasure of the archive or of history that needs to be compensated with new fabulations that are both personal and and historically research and and also fictional. So this idea of a history that needs to be rewritten is very central in the story quilts and the, the kind of apotheosis is in the French collection, which is a, um, a cycle of 12 quilts uh, among her largest and most beautiful ones in which she imagines a young alter ego of herself in Paris at the beginning of the 20th century, magically meeting all the guys from Van Gogh to Gauguin, who actually she meets in Arles, to Picasso, Matisse, uh, Gertrude Stein as, makes an appearance. And, and so it's Faith Ringo slash William Mary living in Paris and revealing Paris and the birth of modern art and the birth of modernity as a much more polyphonic and intricate texture uh, of voices and colors. And, uh, you know, she sits for Matisse as a kind of odalisque that also uh, immediately um, brings to mind the, the odalisques of Ingres and, uh, uh, and also the Olympia uh, of Manet. Uh, and then she sits also for Picasso. And by doing so, she, she kind of reconfigures the history of art, reconfigures the history of art as a dialogue across culture, which you know, we know of uh, and now, uh, but uh, uh, she was already anticipating debates. If you think of shows like, you know, Posing Modernity or or The Black Model at the Dorset, you know, the debate about the origin myths of modern art uh, and how they need to be rethought nowadays, um, Faith was already 
pointing in that direction in 1990, 91. And, and so the cycle is displayed on the fourth floor of the new museum. It's the first time it's brought together in 24, 25 years. So it's really an exceptional presentation. And, uh, uh, you know, it's 12 different lenders and, and that took <laughs> a lot. It's uh, But it's really an amazing sight to see. I I think that's amazing. I just wanted to ask you about Tar Beach, the, the sort of beginning of her journey into children's books, as you say, and 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 this wonderful detail in the catalogue, which is that um, both Chabalala Self and Jordan Castile, two young artists, and they access faith initially through that story, and then embark on a longer journey, you know, through her wider practice. Yes, you know the the presence of Tar Beach in. Uh, New York and in America as a book is just extraordinary. You know, I, I was not born here. I've been living here for a while. So, you know, I encounter the book later, not as a child, but since I've been here, it's just amazing. Literally, uh, first week of January, uh, you know, my child who's six is back on Zoom because of Omicron and I'm sitting in the living room and he's sitting in the kitchen and I hear Faith's voice reading Tar Beach because that's, you know, it's uh, taught and read uh, in first grade. And uh, and so it's really amazing. And again, it's uh, Faith uh, reinventing an art world for herself because the art world is not receptive to her or a certain art world is not receptive to her. And through the books, she manages to to enter a much wider space in, uh, I don't want to say clandestinely, but uh, certainly uh, through means of distribution that we don't typically associate with art, you know. And again, uh, by doing it with children's books so you know it's a bit of a minor art as uh, quilting and you know, she, you know she's occupying again a space uh, that would be typically left out of the canon you know even in the history of the reception of her work and it's really fascinating the 60s work the paintings have been basically with her until now you know MoMA acquires it in 18 the National Gallery acquires the flag is bleeding in 2020 uh, you know it's a very recent history and the majority were still with her <clears throat> the quilts and the story quilts are the works for which she was maybe more known or that enter many museum collection you know for the new museum show we have more than 30 museum loans but the interesting thing, they mainly enter through the textile departments. You know, she was entering from a field that was probably more receptive also to diversity, as uh, we say today. Or she wouldn't enter through the door of painting and sculpture. She would enter through the door of textile. And, uh, um, and that is immediately, you know, evidence of uh, uh, a history of reception that obviously comes with also many associations that are economical and, and also um, you know, racially connoted. Uh, so the same, you know, with the books, she goes into a field that probably was not her own, and it's a field where you don't expect uh, to see Jasper Jones, you know, or to see, <laughs> to, to mention somebody who's 91 years old like her. You know, Jasper Jones was making books with Samuel Beckett, uh, and uh, Faith Ringel instead, you know, goes to uh, children's literature and produce. 16, 17 amazing books, uh, uh, which give her a presence in uh, everyday life of America that is um, much more pervasive. And, and I think that's also part of the everlasting, let's say, fortune or presence and, and her ability to really uh, reach well beyond the art world. Indeed. I wanted to end by talking about the American collection, because it's in, the, in that collection that she really confronts America's history and the history of, of African-American people. It's very confrontative. And there is actually you know, that early series of tankers where she deals with, you know, called slave rape, where she deals with slavery. Yeah. But she brings it back and, in a multi-part work, the American collection. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, the American collection also, it's quite fascinating in, in the catalogue. Again, Julian Brian Wilson refers to it as the, the matrilineal aspect of Faith's work because they, and also going back to, to auto fiction and, and this kind of, you know, speculative fictions, because the, the American collection is the imaginary group of paintings that the daughter of the protagonist of the French collection makes you know so it's a kind of epic uh, a familial epic in which uh, the daughter of a fictional character 
uh, who has already transformed the history of of art uh, in the 20th century or who has been witness to and, and, and a protagonist in that history gives birth to this daughter who becomes herself an artist and she paints the paintings in the American collection. Uh, the paintings in the American collections, yes, on one hand, l- look at the Middle Passage. There are amazing paintings like We Came to America with a Black Statue of Liberty. It's also technically not a story quilt. It doesn't have words, uh, which allows the paintings to be somewhat larger and um, I think are some of her, I never heard, like to use this terminology, but some of her most accomplished paintings. They're just incredible, uh, beautiful kind of machines, you know, to use the term of uh, 19th century history painting. And so there is the black... That's right. They're, they're two metres square, right? I mean, they're, they're really big yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and something is also happening in the way she treats the figures. You know, she makes the, a, a new flag is bleeding, which is an interesting reversal of the 1967 one. In the 1967 one, and she has often spoken about this, there is no black woman in the picture. There is a black man, there is a white woman and a white man. And she says simply because as a black woman, she felt even marginalized in the civil uh, rights movement. I, you know, Obviously, she's the one painting the picture, but she felt she was not in the picture. And so 30 years later, she paints a new flag is bleeding, which is actually a mother with two children. Uh, so the, the, the woman is now central. But I think what is also interesting is the figure is clearly black, but also takes on a kind of, in my opinion, Pan-American uh, uh, identity. You know, she's black, but she might also be Indio. She might be a Native American. Uh, so, and, and the references also seem to have something to do, at least in my eyes, to pre-Columbian uh, sculpture. Or uh, mm. uh, so, it's a beautiful image of uh, of America, of you know, not white America, and a kind of synthesis of all the non-white Americas. And uh, it's a, it's also a, a sort of God disfigure. Uh, so you see all these uh, elements and mythologies that have, you know, appear multiple times in the work, find a kind of apotheosis in, in this cycle. And then there are very irreverent also rewriting of recent American history. There is a piece in which she, the, the alter ego, uh, paints like Warhol, but paints a black uh, character and not a white celebrity. Or uh, there is a piece with two... Uh, large women figures that, again, are are kind of goddesses, but they're also uh, paintings of Aunt Jemima's, uh, uh, but they also resemble a kind of de Kooning women repainted. So there is a, at that point, as she had done already with the French collection, I think there is a deliberate uh, uh, idea of rewriting history that pervades the work. and, uh, And these paintings are really quite extraordinary. Born in a cotton field is the central piece in the gallery and it's it's amazing. And at that point, I think she's also somewhat feeding on to her own history, you know, and, um, and, uh, and making it uh, part of all the different histories that she, she's rewriting. Well, Massimiliano, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Faith Ringgold, American People, is at the New Museum in New York until the 5th of June. And finally, the Freeze Art Fair opened this week in a new venue in Los Angeles. And so for this episode's Work of the Week, we're heading to L.A. The 95-year-old artist Betty Saar has been on site at the fair to hand paint a recreation of her 1983 public mural, L.A. Energy, on the stand of Robert's Projects. Originally painted on a retaining wall on Fifth Street between Grand and Flower Streets, the dynamic mural was destroyed just four years later during redevelopment of the Bunker Hill neighbourhood. Robert's Projects is also releasing a catalogue about the project which includes sketches, photographs of its creation and documents from Saar's extensive archive which was recently bequeathed to the Getty Research Institute. Helen Stoilus is the editor of our daily newspapers published at Freeze Los Angeles and as the final preparations were being made for the fair she spoke to Julie Roberts, co-founder of the gallery, about Saar's mural. So for Freeze LA, Betty Saar has repainted this historic mural It was originally by the Southern California Edison Electric Company headquarters, hence the kind of energetic theme behind it. Um, It's this beautiful 
kind of abstract, but also drawing on the letters LA energy and having L and A repeated throughout as a motif. Why did you want to bring this kind of incredible historic work back to life here at the fair? Well, it was only in existence for four years. In 1987, it was torn down or destroyed to make room for new construction. Mm -hmm. So we actually learned about the LA Energy mural while we were helping Betty scanning and organizing all of her archives, which are on their way to the Getty Research Institute. So um, Betty has been locating quite a few photos and other historical materials, including all of the original drawings and slides of the mural in progress and the final installation. And Betty was on hand this week to actually paint the mural herself. I saw she yes. was here yesterday. Yes, she was. She is incredibly active, remains active, and she's 95 now. And she was at our booth yesterday and, and oversaw the installation of not only the stencils, but also the painting as well. And for Betty, the L's and the A's were so important because she wanted it to feel as though they had been tossed in the wind. Oh, yeah. Um, in the early 80s, Betty started to really incorporate a lot of um, symbols and imagery in her work. So you'll be able to see there's a, there's a fan image, mm-hmm. there, there's a, like a silver squiggle. And those symbols she has used frequently starting, I would say, in the very early 80s. And what do you think this mural communicates about Los Angeles? Why is it such a unique L.A. work? Well, Betty is, <laughs> she's an Angelino at heart. She was born here and actually she's lived in the same residence since the 60s. Um, she's a quintessential Angelino. And she felt that this would be a perfect time to re-envision this, especially after the, the last two years of the pandemic. And you mentioned that you've kind of been going through her archive as part of this donation to the to the Getty Research Institute. And you've published this incredible catalog as well that has a mm-hmm. lot of the documentation. Can you tell us a little bit about what's in that sure. and what you've discovered? Sure. We have been scanning Betty's slide library for the past, I think, year. And we actually located quite a few um, images of Betty installing, also the final mural, the LA City Fire Department that cleaned the wall prior to the installation of the mural. We found photos that actually Betty's middle daughter, Allison Sar, took of the location of the mural oh, wow. from 1983. We also have the press release from the City of Los Angeles and also Brockman Gallery, both from July in 1983, that provides more information. This was a city-funded work from the Department of Cultural Affairs. Yes, this was commissioned by the City of L.A. Cultural Affairs Department. And so Betty produced a print and also a postcard (laughs) for this. And then we also have in the catalog Betty's ledgers, which provide more details about the actual work, the dimensions, the print, and all of the additions. This is amazing. I'm just looking at these pages now. Yeah. Special thanks to the fire station. I saw the photo of the firefighters kind of posing with their engine after hosing down the the wall. That's so great. With Betty. There's a great photo. Here's Betty here with them. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, but Betty, she is absolutely such an incredible memory, and she, she knew who the person was that helped with the installation, um, one of the muralists, and we were able to locate him. His name is Eloy Torres, and he also, he remembered the other woman, Margaret Garcia. Oh, wow. So we were able to determine the identities of all the people, you know, that helped Betty with realizing the mural. Because this was a massive, I mean, it's, you know, blocks long, this mural. Yes, yeah. In fact, we have the exact dimensions. It was 163 feet long by 35 feet high. Great. And it's been recreated to scale here, so it's on a smaller scale. On a smaller (laughs) scale, yes. In fact, the way that Betty was able to determine the the scale of the stencils was from the original photos comparing the the assistants that helped. So it was all done on on the same human scale. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Wonderful. And it wraps around the entire booth here at Freeze LA. Yes. And then inside you're showing... LA artists it's LA kind of an artists. homage to LA yes the O to LA we've actually we've represented Kehende Wiley now since 2002 and so we have a major Kehende in our booth and we our next show with Kehende will be opening this fall at our gallery and it will be our new gallery space that we're opening on La Brea 
Okay. Which we're excited about that. And then also we're showing, uh, highlighting Brenna Youngblood, who's an L.A.-based artist as well. And we have a, a new work of hers, too. Great. Well, thank you so much, Julie. Thank you. Thanks. Freeze Los Angeles continues until Sunday, the 20th of February, and you can read more about Betty Sarr's mural and all the latest news from the fair on the website and the app. And if you're in LA, do pick up our daily papers at the fair. And that's all for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julie Mahalska, Amy Dawson, Henrietta Benzel and David Clack. And David is also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Massimiliano, Anthony and Kwame, Helen and Julie. And thank you for joining us. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.